started. And just as folks jump on, um, they can join the conversation at their leisure. How does that work for you? That works just fine for me. Okay. Well, everybody who's on, welcome. And uh, we thank you for joining this evening. And uh, you know, this really is an open dialogue, very casual. So anytime you want to mute yourself and ask a question, or if you want to put it in the chat box, and I'm happy to read that and share um, whatever you like to do is, is completely fine by us. So I would like to introduce Dr. Gregory Rice with us here this evening. You pronounce it Rice, right? Rise, as in rise, rise and shine. I'm sorry, rise, rise okay. and shine. Very good, thank you. Um, Dr. Rise is a, a part of Allegheny Health Network uh, here in Western Pennsylvania, and he is actually in Erie out of the um, St. Vincent Hospital. He is a health psychologist there leading his team, and I'm going to turn it over to you now to fill us in a little bit more about you, and um, and we'll we'll jump into our first question of the evening to start us off. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm pretty uh, excited to be here with all of you today at this sort of kitchen roundtable discussion here around uh, after dinner time. Those are always my favorite times for discussions. So uh, that's how I'm going to view this for tonight. Um, so uh, the the title or the theme for today uh, in talking with Vasso about it was uh, I'm really excited about the concept of the resilient warrior, more emphasis on the resilient, but the warrior in the sense of courageous. And uh, also uh, with, uh, very excited to tie that in with rediscovering what I call the coping mindset or what we call in psychology, the growth mindset. I'm gonna try to tie in uh, some of uh, the questions and discussions today may be around those themes. Um, you know, uh, uh, in particular, I, I don't want to uh, steal the thunder, but I kind of want to segue into a, 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 the, how I'm going to continue to introduce myself. So I've been working with cancer patients, oh, I would say since uh, 2000. I've been working, though, in psychology um, ooh, since 1984. So uh, uh, it's just really a strong, heartfelt vocation for me. And I was always interested in not just keeping psychology in the mental health clinic or in a private practice office or in, in when, when I was working also for the state in the state psychiatric hospital or uh, state uh, prison setting. I wanted to take psychology out into everyday life, into families, into leadership development, and more importantly, into medicine as a sort of just an, a ubiquitous part of healing, rather than just waiting till we get so critically ill that we need to finally talk to a psychologist or psychiatrist because our depression has exacerbated so far down. I'd like to think if we could make psychological services an embedded part of medicine, we could help people sooner um, with their normal reactions of distress to uh, say a physical illness like cancer. So I'm very proud to say that uh, in Erie at St. Vincent Hospital, we have a cancer center and uh, I'm the first uh, full-time clinical health psychologist exclusively devoted to serving the needs of our cancer patients. So that's just uh, so heartwarming for me for something I've been pursuing uh, since I retired from state civil service in 1999, a full-time working with Bin Medicine in general and with cancer patients, specializing with cancer patients and also cardiac patients and over the years, some other ones as well. But uh, so that's something I'm very passionate about. I'm really also really, one of the things I see that I wanted to tie in with this was actually the question that sort of came up to kind of lead the discussion, which is, you know, it, it dealt with kind of what we call in psychology, uh, anticipatory anxiety, worrying about what's next. You know, and, and anyone that has suffers any kind of medical illness, whatever stage we're at, whether we say, uh, well, you're in remission you're, or you're cured, you're, you're still going to go for follow up tests. And there's going to still be that little bit of anxiety of worrying about what's next. Or if you're at the initial stages of your treatment, there's also what's next. <laughs> and that it can create a sense of anxiety and nervousness, uh, trying to anticipate what's going to happen. 
And is it going to be what I want to happen or not? So that's very real. That's such a huge, honest, open question. I'd like to delve into that. Uh, and you know, I was just reading, uh, I've been really into uh, different uh, literature and I've been reading a topic on what's called uh, developing a growth mindset. And um, they were talking about different ways we can uh, encourage learning and a more positive approach of resiliency. One of the things they talked about is make sure you tell stories because it enhances our memory and attaches some emotional impact to uh, remembering an important point in our development. So uh, in that case, and I was born to be a psychologist because of my grandparents and their love of storytelling. So uh, please bear with me for a minute because I have a story I'd like to share with you that would kind of kick this off and kind of tie in with some of the themes tonight. I hope you don't mind uh, and bear with me. So I'm going to share with you uh, a, a very real patient of mine. When I was first starting off uh, specializing in this work, um, of course, I, uh, I'm going to maintain her anonymity and confidentiality. Um, uh, so we'll call her uh, Mary. And um, so Mary came to me as a middle-aged married woman with no children. And she was diagnosed with an advanced form of cancer uh, that at the time did not have a treatment or cure associated with it. So, but they did have some experimental treatment they offered her with no reassurance of survivability and with some potentially real horrible side effects. So uh, Mary decided she was gonna refuse treatment and her hospice and wasn't sure what was next. This is when I met her. And of, uh, of course I respected her decision of how she wanted to proceed. Or it was not, you know, that's her choice. And, uh, and kind of asked her, well then how do you want to live the rest of your life? And she kind of cocked her head and looked at me and says, I don't know. And there's still so many things I want to do and now I can't. And uh, at this point, she cried, I was probably in tears with her. She felt depressed, hopeless, and dejected. And then I told her a story. I'm not sure what made me tell her this story because it was a little bit risky, but I thought, well, no more risky than the position she's in right now. So I'm gonna take that same risk with you. This story came to my mind. And she said, yeah, tell me. So it goes like this. A ferocious hungry tiger was chasing a woman along a mountain ridge. And she was being chased at the very edge of the cliff of the ridge. The tiger was closing the distance. And just as the monster was about to get her, she climbed over the ridge and found a vine to hold on to while she was suspended in the air. From bad luck to worse, the vine was loose and fragile and barely holding her weight. To make matters even worse, a small mouse was gnawing at the ends of the vine. As she tightly held on, she saw coming through the crags of the cliff, a wild strawberry that was ripe. She reached out with one hand, plucked the strawberry and put it in her mouth. It was so sweet. And that's the story I told Mary. And she kind of tilted her head and didn't know what to make of it. Many times, I'm still not sure what to make of it. But with that said, she said she'd go home and mull it over to our next session. So here's the cool part, what happened next in our follow-up session. Um, I can't make this up. Mary came in excited, smiling, and talking. She said, I've been thinking about the story you told me. So I've made some decisions. I've never finished my college degree. Uh, <clears throat> 22 years later, I still get choked up by the story. Um, I'm one semester short of the credit I need to graduate. I always, and you know what else? I always wanted to throw clay on a wheel and make some pottery. So I've made some decisions. I said, well, what's that, Mary? She said, I contacted the college and talked to the Dean's registrar office. I asked for permission <clears throat> to re-enroll and finish my degree after 20 years. It was granted. So I'm enrolled in college. I'm a college student now. Oh, I'm not done. I also enrolled in a pottery class. I'm going to learn how to throw pots on a wheel. Now you can only imagine the joy on her face and mine. And guess what happened? 
she graduated from college. She later showed me pictures of her graduation. And I know I shouldn't say this person's name because it's controversial, but not at the time. She was so proud. She received her diploma from Dr. Bill Cosby. And as she finished her story, uh, she gave me a present during, uh, during her, our last session. Her time was getting short. And I had to bring it home today because I always keep it in my office. It's the clay pot she made for me before she died. So for me, Mary's forever a reminder of courage, of grace, of healing, of what is real healing, of determination to make the most of our precious time of this gift we call life. Her bowl has graced my office for over 20 years. She's the epitome of grace, gentleness, and a resilient warrior in face of adversity. I just consider her the epitome of courage. So with that story, I would like to hear your stories. What has inspired you? What people do make you want to continue to tell your story and to give them encouragement as you receive theirs? I, I would love to hear your views on this. Please feel free to unmute yourself and, and share if you'd like. Hi, um, my name is Mimi, and this is the first time I've been able to join a call. Um, my, I'm, my daughter is the one who has cancer, not myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one thing that obviously it's her that keeps me going, but um, one of the things that's been amazing is that, you know, I'm the adult, she's the child, but in many instances, she's teaching me a lot more right now than I can teach her. The way she has handled as an 11 year old, um, this whole process, she's handled a thousand times better than I have. Um, for example, um, she went into full on anaphylactic shock during one of her chemo treatments, which is not a vision you ever want to see on anyone, much less your own child. And I don't think I'll ever get that visual out of my head as long as I live. Um, but the nurses and the doctors were there with the correct, correct protocol and they, everything was fine. Um, they knocked her out with Benadryl and, and steroids and they had the epinephrine ready. So she went to sleep. Um, she woke up an hour and 15 minutes later and said, what time is it, mom? I have dance tonight. And I just had to laugh because I thought, okay, um, okay. Um, and then because of this shock to this medicine, she had to start, uh, enter a study where she, instead of getting this dose of medicine, for every one dose, she had to get six shots, intermuscular thought, shots into her thighs, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and two on Friday to last her through the weekend. So there's eight doses of this original medicine. So she had 30 some odd shots in her legs. And the night before the new protocol, of course, I'm nervous anytime you start something new. And she even said to me, are you nervous, mom? I said, a little bit. It's a new medicine. I try to be honest with her, but yet appropriate, you know, not let her see my fear, but just voice, you know, the age appropriate concerns. And I said, I'm a little bit concerned. You know, I don't know how you're going to react to the medicine. You know, the shots are going to be painful. And she said, I'm not worried. She goes, I'm excited. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, this is a study. This is going to help other kids. I get to help other kids. Yeah. So that's an 11 year old. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, wait. <laughs> so yeah. that's one example of how, um, you know, she's the one who keeps me going. You know, Mimi, that's to me, the epitome also of what I would call how, ch how children reflect a growth mindset. Now, I'm sure, you know, you and other loved ones play a large part of that development of that mindset of your daughters, which we reflects well, you know, on, on that. But that's just the epitome of 
continuing to stay open rather than closed about what's left for me to do. What, what can, how can I continue to grow? How can I continue to learn as opposed to being exceptionally focused on when's it going to end as opposed to what am I going to learn now? So that's just, that's just wonderful. And because when you think about it, there's lots of people who are living quite lengthy lives with maybe not a lot of illness and <laughs> never think past a closed mindset of, uh, of not learning or growing. Um, and um, so I like how you're turning this into a powerful lesson for yourself as well. That's just wonderful. Thanks. This is Deborah. Um, Mimi, my situation is very similar to yours. It was my son who was diagnosed with cancer in 2017 at the age of 17. And he's 21 now. Um, we had a similar experience with um, being allergic to one chemo and having to go the route of the injections. And those experiences are traumatizing as a mother, you know, to see those things happen to your children as if the cancer diagnosis itself weren't. Um, right, you know, right. Then the lengthy treatment process is hard. And I think one of the things that I have learned is that I mean, nothing prepares you to walk this path, either as a patient or as a parent. And um, it's about choices. You know, it's about choosing to continue to live or choosing to, you know, sit in the chair and, and worry about what's next. Um, and sometimes you do a little of both and it's a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, but I, that's one of the things that I have learned through our journey is that you have to, to make those choices to keep living. Hey, hey, thank you so much for saying that, Deborah. That again is a wonderful compare and contrast to what I would again call the growth mindset versus you know, a closed mindset. But I also wanna be cautious to say, no one's ever totally one or the other, right? There may be our cer certain circumstances I'm very flexible, man, and I'm very open. <laughs> you know, and there may be other times where I'm like, eh, now, and and you know, and we all have our triggers and our you know foibles or weaknesses where maybe we shut down, and other areas where we find ourselves maybe less threatened and we're more open. But I don't want us to think though about this in terms of an absolute that I'm either an open mindset or a closed mindset. Rather, I'd rather us thinking as we're human beings who are going to make mistakes and can we catch ourselves as we make them and continue to learn to grow from them. So even our mistakes, which may appear as a closed down situation, we can really transform into a moment of growth for us. So, uh, and as for you are learning that as a mom, as a caregiver um, from uh, your son from your, you know, who's a, who's a patient. So that's just, that's just, that's just wonderful. But I do want to uh, make, make it clear that at different times too, in our treatment, right? There may be certain times in our treatment where we get so tired, so dejected, where we've been getting bad news after bad news, where maybe we find ourselves shutting down and feeling like oh, our options are closing down and I, and I start be developing a pessimistic or closed mindset. And then as caregivers, like, what do we say? What do we do? How do we provide encouragement? You know, and how, or if we, there's no one around us, how do we provide encouragement to ourselves? I'm sorry, I'm a hand talker, by the way. <laughs> uh, and the way we encourage that is I want you to think of it in terms of gentle reminders of, yes, this is tough what we're going through. And remember what you've gone through already and how you toughed it out. Remember the grit you showed after that third treatment and how you just persevered anyways and, and how much pain it was and how dog tired you were. And here you are. And maybe you're not doing it right now, but you can develop that attitude again because it's still there. 
So you're providing encouragement, but not denying the reality of it's getting, it's getting tiring. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough line. You want to acknowledge both. You don't want to err on either side. I'm Alia. Um, hey, Alia. I am. Um, thanks, Dr. Greg. I'm appreciative that you're here tonight to talk about these things. And um, I think for me, given, you know, Vasa had, was asking me at the start of the conversation about just a recent procedure I had. Um, in October, I was diagnosed for the third time with sarcoma in my right uh, leg. And um, sarcomas can occur in muscles and bones, and mine was in my muscle. And I was first diagnosed six years ago, and then I had a recurrence last year. Um, I had a surgery in September of 2020 to remove the recurrence. And then just this past October, so like not even 13 months after the recurrence, I had a third, I guess you'd call it a second recurrence, a third instance of the cancer. Um, and I was very, very devastated by that because I felt like, oh, I, I felt, I felt so defeated by the cancer, like it's this, this beast just stalking me down like the tiger because it keeps coming after me. It keeps coming after me. And I felt so dejected. And the, the first time was the first, each time has been hard in a different way. Um, um, but the first time was really hard because of the chemo that was really, um, ugh debilitating. Um, and then of course the surgery I had, uh, I did have radiation and then I had surgery and the surgery just, they took out my hamstring muscle, like the whole thing, they took it out. So my leg sort of looked half its size. And then with the recurrence I had last September, it's 2020, they actually had to cut out a piece of my sciatic nerve because the new tumor was growing against that. So it was almost like I had an amputation because my foot and lower leg just went limp, paralyzed. And so I have to wear a brace now to hold my foot at a right angle in order to walk and not trip over my toes. So I, you know, I, this, this past year, and I love to run. And after the first instance when they took up my hamstring they said I probably wouldn't run again and I taught myself how to run and I started running again um on a treadmill not on like terrain uh, because that was just a little too uneven but I could do it on a treadmill but after this surgery I had in September of 2020 when they cut the static nerve they I I you know I can't even walk normally so let alone run so this past year I've spent grieving the loss of my normal ability to walk, you know, not, not even, you know, let alone run. It was just walking that I just, I'm walking normally that I missed and dealing with like the, the vanity aspects of it. Um, you wearing a brace on my leg. Um, this sounds like really vain and, uh, uh, frivolous, but not being able to wear like cute shoes anymore because you can't, you have to wear like tennis shoes now when you wear a brace. And I think dealing with people's like gaze immediately going to my foot all the time, like when I'm out in public and it's really, it, 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 it creates like a self-consciousness in me that I haven't, I don't think I've ever experienced before. And it's really, it's, it's annoying. <laughs> it's, you know, you just, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's as though I am an amputee because I don't have the functioning in my lower leg and my foot. Um, and it's, 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 it's like, I mean, this is like my prosthetic, this, this brace that I wear. So I spent this past year grieving 
the loss of my normal walking function, the loss of being able to run after I taught myself how to against what I was told. Um, and then just the, um, the, the shock to my system of just being looked at differently by people. And sometimes people, they don't, they don't know, they don't, they just, you know, they look at it and they think, you know, like, like, for example, I substitute teach at a high school and I hadn't uh, seen one of the teachers in a while. And I was walking down the hall and she's like, Oh my God, what happened to you? That looks really uncomfortable. And it was just like kind of mortifying because she thought I like twisted my ankle or something like that. And, you know, I told her, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. <laughs> I wasn't going to get into a conversation in the hallway with the kids around, but, um, but like stuff like that, I think people, they don't, they don't, um, they don't mean to make you feel self-conscious or embarrassed because they just don't have any experience with it. They just assume you like hurt yourself running and it's some like temporary thing that's going to, you know, pass. But for, and for me, it's, it's not going to pass. It's something I'll, I'll always have. I'll have to always wear this brace. Um, so I think um, there's that vanity aspect uh, of it um, and the self-consciousness of it and, and a little bit of the resentment because um, I guess, you know, it, it, or maybe envy is a better, better word. I envy people who can walk normally because I can't anymore. Um, and I envy people who just walk like I, you know, had, I, I go to Houston for my treatments at MD Anderson and I'm walking through the airport and I'm, you know, I have kind of like a limp to my gate now. And, and I look at these people who were like racing through the airport and I just think, God, you, you have no idea how lucky you are that you can race through the airport right now. And if I were, you know, running late for a flight, I would surely miss it because I can't do that anymore. I'm, you know, I'm kind of hobbling through. Um, and so I spent, so I spent this past year just grieving the loss of what I knew and what I had and what I'd always had. Um, and I imagine it is like what people go through who do get amputations, you grieve the loss of life as you knew it. Um, and so I thought, I thought that surely, you know, this is about, I mean, it's not as bad as it can get by any means, because I'm still here, but it, 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 I, I went four years without it coming back and, and it came back that time. And I just thought, God, I paid my dues. I went through that horrible, horrible chemo and I went through a very difficult, painful surgery. And I felt like I should have been good. But when it came back, I realized how naive I had been and how um, maybe maybe jaded I had been I I you, you think that you like I said you think you paid your dues and you don't have to worry about it coming back but but it did come back so again this past year I really I was a, has been a, a year of bereavement for me and then in October when I was diagnosed for the third time on the exact same day as my first diagnosis the exact same day six years apart October 21st, I just couldn't believe this was happening yet again. It was, it, it, I felt so defeated and so dejected and so, so, and, and if, if I, if I felt like I had um, been naive before, um, what was this, you know, how, uh, how does this happen yet again? And, um, <laughs> Ali, I'm at yeah, go ahead. for a second. Yeah. Um, you know, as I was listening to you, one of the things that was uh, striking me, and, and I'm not sure if other of the participants have had similar stories of, of feeling as if I paid my dues. Why is this now happening again? You know, sort of a, 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 a why me now? You know, yeah. and, and, 
And also I wanted to, it was also clear to me that you're not done with your grieving right. yet. I'm going to say right. that again. You're not done with your grieving yet. But one of the things that could help the yet, because you will be someday done grieving, but one of the things that could help is what is the purpose of your grieving? What is your goal? What does the yet look like of the strength and knowledge you've gained? Because you said something really interesting that I, f I find powerful. Actually, I find it giving you an incredible source of power. And that is your ability to sort of critique yourself and say, you know, I was naive. I, I maybe expected too much that maybe I was putting all my hopes of who I am on just a positive outcome. Of, and what and you define that positive outcome. Um, but that's the good news. The good news is you define your outcome. What do you want your outcome to be of the end of your grief process, despite whatever in the hell the medical results say? In other words, we go back to that question is a growth mindset. When you're using grief as a catapult to bounce forward from, as opposed to letting grief become a black hole. The purpose of grief, the healing of grief comes from what am I going to dedicate this suffering to going forward? Because then it's more than just about me. Yeah. And, and then, and that's worth living for even just another hour. Right. If if you if I was at my deathbed and if I could just live one more hour for someone who wanted to see me to come visit, I would stay for that one hour if I could. Mm -hmm. For their sake. And it also keeps me alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the point being is 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 that to me is where the juice of life comes from. You know, when I'm in a growth mindset, it's, it's myself in relationship to others, growing with other people. When I'm in a fixed mindset, the world's closing in on me. It's, I feel defeated. I feel dejected. Now, I'm not saying that's not a normal feeling. I didn't say that. I'm just saying when we can recognize that, we can turn it on its heels by saying, and how can I use this to give me power, to give me strength going forward? Because... One of the things you're right that you said earlier, which is, boy, these people just don't know what a mir miracle it is to be able to run, to be able to move in your body freely. But you know what that feels like now. That gives you tremendous power, wisdom, and perspective that those other people do not have. And that's worth sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I have to say, I absolutely love what you just said. You define your outcome. So simple yet so spot on. Who said that? That's me. Oh, oh. you said that. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I say that? You okay. said that. That's what oh, I said. I guess you didn't hear your own words. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, re, I'm just responding to, to as honestly as I can. Uh, no, which, I love that. Which is, which is really my hope for all of us. Because you, because, you know, that's the cool thing about a growth mindset and being resilient is ultimately, you know, I hate to say this, but it's also kind of selfish because, and I'm going to admit it, um, when I'm more altruistic and open to other people, I feel better. <laughs> I don't feel better about myself when uh, I'm like the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Even if I come up with right answers about why it is, I still don't feel good about it. Uh, but when I feel open, when I feel open to growth, when I feel open about how can I contribute in a small way, I, I, I feel better <laughs> about what I can do, whether it's just for a day, whether it's a, a, a large amount or a very small amount. I, I, it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, we, we do define. In other words, you don't, if you take something like an outcome, 
any outcome, whether it be an outcome of a medical result, an outcome of a test, if you take that as the final answer of who you are, I got an A plus, or I got a F, or I got a, 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 a relapse occurring, or I got no relapse. Occurring. However, if, if that's your sole definition of the magic of who you are, then I say that's not big enough. <laughs> That's, you're, you're much bigger than that. You're much more precious than that. It was said to me one time that everything that happens to us, none of it is a, a positive or a negative. It's how we react to it that makes it become a positive or a negative. And I, I think that goes back again to what, you said before about defining your outcome. Uh, similarly, are you going to make it a positive or are you going to make it a negative? Well, you know, uh, so that's a good point. But we could, but we have to be careful again how we could err too much on one side or the other. So I'm kind of like a pragmatist because I'm not going to say, you know, that you know uh, uh, Alia's results are great positive results for her, right? That would be disrespectful of, of an obvious, uh, uh, not a happy conclusion of, of your treatment. Right. So, so, so we wanna honor that, but, we, but then we have to honor it, and I think in perspective of who I am. Am I defined by an outcome? I'm not saying an outcome is not a part of what I need to cope with, and my struggles of suffering and what I have to deal with and learn from. But truly, I'm no more my cancer than I am my left earlobe. <laughs> you know, I'm much bigger than that. Uh, so, so uh, you know, and if it's a, a nice earlobe, great. If it's not, okay, I'm still bigger than that. <laughs> um, so, uh, and the other thing is, it's nice to expand who we are, which goes all also into this concept of the uh, growth mindset or the coping resilient mindset. Am I doing this alone? You know, and I know it's a normal human reaction. It's it probably the animal in us, right? When an animal is injured, what do they normally do, right? They kind of close in on themselves, right? They go away from the pack. They lick their wounds, right? They kind of stay by themselves while they're getting sick. So there's that kind of animal nature in us that when we get sick, when we have bad news, we kind of close in. I don't want to say you shouldn't do that. That's just a normal reaction. But when we find ourselves doing that, we can ask ourselves, well, as I'm closing in, that's also indicative of a closed mindset. How can I still stay open? I may need some time alone to sort it out. That's true but I'm using inner resources and then I can learn to expand those resources. How do I not close myself off from the support of other people to help me with my healing? Um, so do I grieve? Do I grieve alone or do I grieve within a, within a community? I, I think in terms of our healing, you know, the answer is clear. What's more healing for the, for bereavement? is to be healing within the context of a community because we didn't come in alone. <laughs> you know? We came in the context of a, of, a, of, a, of a mother and father for most of us, or at least an egg and a sperm. So we didn't come in alone and we weren't raised alone, right? And, uh, and even though it feels sometimes we feel alone and sometimes we may feel like we're dying alone. But if you've ever been with someone you love who are dying, you know damn well they're not alone. You're with them. And so we need to stay open to that. Not to close our boundaries, but keep our social boundaries open to the support that others want to lend to us that we can use as healing that we'll have plenty of time later to pay back. What about uh, um, the rest of you? I would love to hear if any of you would have any comments. And I'm also comfortable with any challenges you may have. If 
if you feel like uh, what I'm saying you disagree with or you would like to challenge me on it, I'm to that's totally okay. Um, this is Mimi again. I just had one um, comment to add to what you were referring to about how um, we aren't, we aren't, cancer isn't our definition of who we are. Um, again, going back to children, and it's not just my daughter, but, you know, there's a few examples of, you know, she said, mom, I just, I don't want to be the kid with cancer. And I'm like, you're not, you're Lexi, you're a dancer, you're this, you're that. So when she got her wig, you know, I had her wear it and she and got in the car and pulled it off the first day and said, ah, and that, and then she never wore it again. She said, I'm fine. I don't need it. You know, when she had her picture taken and she had peach fuzz and she said, I look fine with my peach fuzz. I said, Oh, yes, you do. And then I applied for some assistance and it, and, it, and there was one box about, you know, is your child have a disability? Well, she doesn't have a disability, but in the definition of this form, she did. So she wasn't happy about that. She didn't want to be defined as a child with a disability. That really bothered her. Um, and she truly lives every day. Like cancer is not the first thing that she thinks of when she wakes up at all, but she's extremely on top of things. For example, if, if she has a headache and I offer her time on, she says, you know, we have to take my temperature first. We've got to make sure we take the temperatures because it could hide an infection. So even as an 11 year old, she has this wisdom about her an innocent wisdom, a wisdom that I need to take care of this, but then I can put it on a shelf so much easier than I do as an adult. And I'm not the one that's sick. So it's always fascinating to me to see things through the eyes of children. It's so much more simplistic and innocent in some, in some ways. So she says she's not a kid with cancer. She's Lexi. Yeah. Um, and, and again, all I keep thinking about Mimi is, uh, um, you know, she did, she did not develop that growth mindset in a vacuum. So uh, that's, that's a very sweet story. Um, Mimi, I have to add to that. I, I love that you shared that about the wig because when my sister was going through treatment as a teenager, we, we got her a wig and uh, when it showed up, uh, she said the same thing. This is not me. And she actually <laughs> named it. Um, that wig, that was Mona, like where that name came from. We know no Mona's. We <laughs> but Mona <laughs> went in the closet on the, the wig stand thing. And, um, and we joked about Mona because it, it was not her, but it was, it was wonderful that, and I never heard that from anybody else. So I really appreciate you saying that because, um, um, I, I thought that was just our own family. <laughs> no, and you know, Lexi competes and dance and I encouraged her to wear it during one of her shows and during her competitions because we didn't want the judges to be influenced by the fact that she had a bald head and they, it was obvious that there was something wrong with her. We wanted her to be judged for her dancing. Well, by the third competition, she's like, I don't care. It's uncomfortable. I don't like it. It's not me. And the dance instructor said, don't wear it then. And so she didn't for her last competition. And you could see she felt much freer and much more herself in her dance. So, you know, as much as I'm grateful for the wig and I'm glad we had the opportunity to try it. Um, like you said, she's, she's her and, and she's fine. That's awesome. That is. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Or... We still have uh, a little bit more time. I don't, I'm not sure who asked uh, the question about the um, in anticipatory anxiety, um, but uh, I, I really am grateful for just the poignancy of it or the honesty of it. Um, it it's, it's such a good, honest question. And it's not so much that there's a, a right answer to it or not. I think it's more a matter of, you know, everybody's welcome here in terms of all the uh, bugaboos in our mind, the naysayers and the yaysayers. Um, you know, I, I, if I could say anything to all of you, it's welcome them in don't turn them away and because it, it's always better to have a conversation with a part of you 
uh, rather than ignore something you're afraid of to have a conversation with. Um, and trust in that ability of and wisdom of yours to do that. Um, I, we get into, I think, too much trouble when we turn our back on what we're afraid of. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and because of that, it's always much scarier in our imagination. <laughs> I'm not sure if we actually read um, the, we, we jumped into the question, but never actually stated it. What the person shared was when I find myself going down that rabbit hole of what if I have a reoccurrence, what will that mean? How do I know for sure that all my cancer is gone? What's a good way of stopping this frame of mind? So it's the, the constant running of questions in your mind in that, that vicious loop almost. It just keeps right. repeating and repeating. Right. Um, right. You know, th thank you for, for restating that uh, um, so clearly, because you're right, it wasn't, it wasn't stated. Um, and I do want to say then a, a way you don't stop it is you don't say stop. Um, you never tell an emotion or a thought to stop or go away. Um, it's a waste of energy. Instead, you ready? just shift your mindset. It's really can be that simple. It can be as simple as changing a channel on a television set. Um, yeah, but it's not with the idea of chastising ourselves where, you know, you can't be upset. You can't uh, be uh, angry or you can't be disappointed or afraid. Of course you can be. And you give yourself full permission to feel that. And you can also feel something else. And what could that be? So rather than turning something down, because whenever you push something away, there's always going to be a push back. So instead, I would always ask, and what's next? What else can I be? How else can I be? And by that very question, you now just entered into a growth mindset, which is a maximum mindset to problem solve and to resolve into healing. What's next? I'm not done resolving my grief yet, but something's going to happen next. I wonder what that's going to be. Very helpful words. Well, you sir, I, I can't help but notice uh, you know, the class, is that the refrigerator there with all the magnets on it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's classic. Sorry, my battery was dying. No, no, I, no, I, I, I love I loved this. Like it's everybody's, it's everybody's refrigerator. It's perfect. <laughs> I have three kids. There's a lot of stuff that holds the refrigerator up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So Dr. Rice, can you explain that again, that when you do start having that feeling of fear, you know, like, like I said, I've had this sure. diagnosed three times. Right. How do I keep from worrying about another time or other time? Yeah. You know, how do I, I replace that? Is that what you're saying? Replace that worry well, with? Well, well, I, I think it, it helps to, in other words, you can't pre prepare for an opponent in a match. Think of yourself as an athlete, say or warrior. You can't prepare yourself for a match if you haven't studied the enemy and you haven't studied his moves and how he plays and what his uh, strengths are, what his weaknesses are, what your strengths and weaknesses are to wrestle with this. So that requires a sense of stepping back and looking. So I would say like, okay, welcome your opponent of anxious, worrying mind of what's going to be next and welcome and, and study him study her, you know, what do you, what, what is she teaching you about you? And in, and in the process, you end up diffusing this mind because now you've just stepped out of it without making it obvious. <laughs> so you want to welcome your guest into your home and you, you offer a tea and uh, see what it happens. Like, oh, I can handle this guest. I know, how to, I know what to do here, but you can't do that if you don't invite it in. And the very invitation of come in, you're welcome, is the first step of courage, isn't it? 
That's which is the first step of warrior warriorship, which is the first step of resilience, of bouncing forward, which is the first step of a growth mindset. Welcome in. I'm not threatened by you. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not going to try to change you. You're, you're teaching me something important. And then write down what it's teaching you. That's a lot to stop and think about. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm listening to you and I'm processing and, and thinking myself, but um, I, I, I'm obviously not in your head, Alia, but I'm, I'm just thinking to myself. That's That was a lot to think about and in a, a different perspective. I appreciate that. Well, you know, if, if, if I offered anything of value tonight, it simply comes from my hopefully trying to be a good student of the thousands of patients who've taught me. So I'm well aware of the shoulders of all the giants I'm standing on. I am totally humbled by that. When I think that's the part that goes back to community like you said, and where we learn from one another and you get strength from being with others and, and uh, not being alone because you're right. not. Right. I even think of that in terms of the extended family, you know, in, in the past, you know, I was blessed to have, be very involved with all four of my grandparents and uh, um, my Polish and Italian relatives. And, they were an extension of the family wisdom, weren't they? And I used them that way deliberately as a child. I, I just literally adored them and couldn't wait to sit at their feet to hear their stories. Um, and and that was that's wisdom that they're transferring to me. Um, and and that's the that's the purpose of family, of community, of extending our support to others and letting ourselves be open to the support of others. Um, we're sharing then, we're kind of extending our heart and mind into a community we can learn from and contribute to. That's, that's also, that's so hugely important because when you think about it, we didn't evolve as an animal by being the smartest or the strongest. We survived these millions of years by having the largest communal heart, by knowing how to work together and support each other. There's a challenge in that too, though. Pardon me? I said, there's a challenge in that as well. I, I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but sorry, Deborah, that was a, a slip of the tongue. <laughs> um, but what I mean though is um, you have to choose your village wisely. Oh yeah, sure. Because sure. Um, sure. Yeah. I've unfortunately dealt with, and Deborah, you can probably chime in on this. Um, as a mom of a child with um, cancer, uh, their parents think that it's okay for them to tell you what you should and shouldn't do in the care of your child. I was actually told in a text message by someone that I was dragging my daughter to dance class so that I could pretend like life was normal. When in fact, our doctors had encouraged her that when she felt up to it and her neutrophil count was good, tell her to go, it's PT without the PT, she needs to live. We don't keep the kids in a bubble anymore. So even though I was doing exactly what my doctors told me, I had to fight some backlash from these quote unquote, you know, friends of mine that. I've come to find really aren't friends because I normally was not someone that would confront people, but mama bear kind of stood up and said, Oh <laughs> no, we're not doing this. Right. This is not going to have, this is not going to be the way that we operate here. And I wasn't as nice as I was just now. Um, because again, mama bear comes out and it's like, you're not going to tell me how to raise my child or how to care for her because I'm, I'm on it. I'm hundred percent on this. So I've had some ridicule, you know, you're sending her to school during a pandemic. So I'm a hundred percent in agreement that, you know, you need to reach out and you need to build your village and your community. Um, but you also have to be careful and protect your heart at the oh. same time. Oh, right on. I mean, we can't be, uh, 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 we have to show 
discrimination of forces around us to promote our healing and to promote a more growth mindset, not a closed mindset. Absolutely. I should have said, Mimi, thank you for that wonderful, important reminder. I, I, I kind of make that as an assumption, but and thank you for calling it out that it should be explicit, not just implied. So very, very well said. Thank you. And I can say that um, when my son went through treatment, um, his doctors were always very encouraging for him to do whatever he could, whatever he was able to do. And, um, you know, they explained to us that there would always be a risk versus benefit in making these decisions. And some of them would be hard. And, and I found at times um, the, I experienced fears that threatened to overwhelm me, you know, watching him, letting him go and do things that I feared for him to do. And one example is um, while he was still in treatment, he had an opportunity to travel out to Yellowstone National Park and spend a summer working. And um, he, he desperately needed to do that because he was very deep into treatment and he was very tired of it. And um, his doctors recognized that this change um, and this experience would be fabulous and, and help him to make it to the finish line. But you can imagine how I felt. I live in Pennsylvania, sending him out there for three months uh, we had to arrange for him to travel on his own to his treatments. And oh yeah, it was the most difficult summer of my life. But now I can look back and see how good that was for him. But I can relate to what you're saying, Mimi, with the, the judgment of others. But um, I don't know. When we entered this path, um, I never shied away from uh, being his advocate. <laughs> no matter who I was dealing with and um, sort of grew broad shoulders with regard to um, the opinions of others. Well, again, there's another lesson. I have a very thin skin um, low self-esteem issues that I've dealt with from childhood trauma. So, you know, I never really stood up for myself, but when it came to my child, that's a whole different story. And I learned, I, I found my is. voice. Mm -hmm. I found my voice from this situation and I learned to care a lot less what people think. Um, and keep it in, not, not care because I don't want to be cynical, but to put it in the proper perspective, put it in the proper level of importance. So, you know, what someone who is an acquaintance says to me in a negative manner is a minute, you know, value in my mind. They live rent free for a couple of seconds and then they're gone. <laughs> um, but, you know, people who I respect and I value, um, who are close to me that I trust, their opinion matters a little bit more. But mine and my daughter's is what matters the most. Yeah. There's a lot of freedom in learning to live that way. I'm still working on it. I think we've learned a lot about ourselves when we become parents too. You know, it, it's, it's just interesting to, and especially as they grow and their challenges change and it, it, it kind of morphs with ourselves and how we handle situations and what will, what will make us stand up and what will then some things that we'll let them deal with. It's, it's just, Parenthood is a wild ride. <laughs> Some days I get whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does also speak to, you know, like as with any chronic illness like cancer, you know, the, the different way it resonates through a family and through caregivers and, um, and it impacts people differently. You know, the, I, I always try to, um, uh, um, that's one of the things, one of the first things I try to share with my patients, you know, that your response and your way of coping through this 
is going to be your way. Um, there's no, you know, cookie cutter or recipe for your healing. It's your journey. Well, you know, we'll work with the best of what we have of how you've survived hardships in the past, but uh, it gets sometimes a little tenuous when we want to uh, provide reassurance to others, um, thinking maybe we know what they're going through or vice versa. I want to provide reassurance to someone else when maybe I haven't went through the same surgery, but their response could be totally different. And how can I just be present for them? Share what, you know, what my suffering taught me and be curious with what it's teaching them. But it's, uh, we're, even today with this group, there's people who have different experiences with cancer as a patient, as a caregiver, as a mom, you know, uh, it, it, impact, it impacts a lot of people. Well, we really appreciate everybody's time this evening. And, um, you know, if you think of any questions after today, I'm, I'm more than happy to pass them on to Dr. Greg. I, I'm, I think you, um, would that be okay to forward anything on to you if, sure, if any post questions arise? And um, I will uh, send a follow up email. Dr. Greg has uh, a wonderful list of some books that he has recommended over time. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about that or? Um, no, no, I think uh, they're, 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 I do wanna encourage you that whatever motivates you, like some of the books I recommend that are on mythology, some are about sur uh, uh, surviving through tough uh, circumstances. Some are uh, kind of more academic, uh, uh, self-help kind of books. Some are more positive oriented. Some are more based on education, but they're just things that could be uplifting for you. And I want you to be flexible with yourself with that. You know, there's lots to be said for um, even being mindful of how you curate your own videos at home that you watch. And, and I'm referring to television, you know, and the media you use. Be good to yourself. Um, make you, make sure you're laughing every day, that you uh, feel your heart warming every day, that you feel excited about making a contribution every day. Because unfortunately, the media really doesn't care anything about that. They just want to sell you something. So that means you have to be in charge of that part of your daily programming to, and be proactive about it. So, so, so again, sort of going back to what the theme of what we were all sharing our collective wisdom on, which is how to not let a situation or others define us and what our recovery should look like and healing should look like, that we need to still be at the helm while we're listening and being open to other people's counsel and advice and growing through that, but we're still at, um, at the helm. Good points. Thank you so much, by the way, for having me. It was a real pleasure meeting all of you. I wish you all well, all well. Thank you so much, Dr. Greg, and, and for everybody joining us tonight. Um, yes, and we look thank forward. You. Thank you. You're thank welcome. you. We look forward to doing more talk at, topics in the new year. So if you have suggestions on different areas or expanding upon this topic, you know, please let us know. All right. Happy holidays, everybody. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Rose. you very much. Thanks, Vaso, for organizing. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.